Charlie. <laughs> Hi, Ma. I saw you there too. And hello, everybody. There we go. Okay. Okay. Oh, and I'm glad to see your mother there, Tali, getting lots of nachas. That's the best. How are you? You don't have to unmute. Lovely to see you. And you should have lots of nachas from your gorgeous daughter and all your, all your family, all your beautiful family and your children and grandchildren. That is for sure. Um, but it's lovely to be here. I can't actually believe that we are here. It's Thursday night. Baruch Hashem again, it's not, it's Erev Shabbos, and it is Rosh Chodesh. So what better time is there for all of us to take this time out and really to be able to learn and to do a little bit of soul searching and to think about where we are in the world, while so many people are in places where they'd love to be sitting where we are sitting now. So it is certainly one thing that for every Jew in the world, for everybody in the world, that Hashem should just give all of us the insight, the energy to hold on to the rope and to make sure that we know that what we're doing where we are is thinking about others as well, as we are hopefully here in our comfort zones. Um, but we never forget anybody. And uh, we are one, Klal Israel. My necklace says Amechad in Amharic and in Hebrew. And we could have a huge, big medallion. So we have Amechad in every language um, that any Jew in the world speaks. But sure. we're going to all be speaking the Ezra Sashem together in the language that is common to all of us. And that will be, please God, in the beautiful holy tongue of, um, of the language that we're given as the gift. Um, Tali, I'm very excited for tonight. Um, so I'm going to not take up anybody's any more time. I just want to add one little thing that this Shabbos um, seed are actually doing. Put Sippy has been, uh, that's why Talia said, I'm not sure if Sippy is going to get the S on or whatever it was going to be. But in, in her amazing way, she changed it and she did it. Um, besides both seed in Manchester and in London have got families who are keeping Shabbos for the first time, families who are keeping Shabbos for many times all joining together. And we have created in seed our own real Shabbos, um, Shabbos project or Shabbat project. But really what it is, is it's our, Shab our Shabbos. It's the gift that we're given always. So we want to be able to use it. And I just wanted to say amazing kolakavod to everybody who's put so much beautiful effort and energy in. And we just go from here and continue to grow. And we will be mafish chala Hashem at the end. And in the meantime, I'm going to invite our lovely Tali Barwin to share some thoughts and inspiration together with us. Thank you, Joanne. Thank you for your um, lovely words of introduction about, you know, the achters. And I think all of us feeling specifically at this point in time with what's going on. And, you know, I've just actually before got posted all these wonderful videos of um, Ukrainian Jews arriving in Israel and our thoughts and actions are trying to be have them in mind. Um, I'm just going to quickly start sharing. Oh, Joanne, is it possible to let me screen share so I can share my PowerPoint? Yeah, I think I'm host. So hang on. So yeah, no, you just to... let me. Perfect. Oh, no, I didn't let you tip it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sibby. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so I don't know if you can see, can you see both at the same time? You should be able to see both, hopefully. Perfect. Lovely. Okay, um, so um, good chodesh, everyone. So nice to kind of be here talking. Um, and really, I wanted to spend this evening looking at emotions and looking at um, Queen Esther. And um, I think um, I'm very mindful of the fact that at the moment, um, many of us post COVID, now with what's going on with Ukraine, lots of worries, lots of uncertainty, and kind of a mixture of kind of emotions going on. And that's why I thought it would be really appropriate to kind of talk about um, emotions at this point. Um, and as I'm saying that, sorry, I'm just trying to work out if I press the next slide, if you will see the, the next slide. Let me just check. Oh, see. Oh, yes. Perfect. Can you see the next slide? 
Great. OK, so I thought it's always really helpful to look at what an emotion actually is. Um, and it's a kind of strong, strong feeling deriving from one's circumstances, moods or relationships with others. And I thought it would be really helpful to kind of just show the spectrum of emotions. If you look at this kind of wheel, you will see such a huge range. I mean, there are kind of main themes, you know, anger, disgust, sadness, all, all around that. But the kind of spectrum of how those feelings can intersperse and kind of mix is obviously really, really um, important. Um, and I think what I really wanted to look at, these are the kind of eight basic emotions that people have, the anger, anticipation, joy, trust, fear, surprise, sadness and, and disgust and really just to kind of focus on um, having emotions and what does that mean to have emotions and what does it mean to suppress emotions and what does it mean to have feelings of sadness and, and especially specifically coming towards Rosh Chodesh Adar and, and thinking about Mishan Nechlas Adar what does that actually mean for us so just looking at emotions I think it's really really important at at first to kind of um, say that emotions are really important and they need space and understanding. And often there's like a tendency that we do it with very young children that they fall over and they hurt themselves and we're like, oh, you're fine and it, it'll be okay. And, and it's only a scratch. And we kind of often um, invalidate emotions. And it's really important to give space to emotions. And it can be difficult to give that space to emotions because we want to fix things. We want everything to be okay. We want you know, people to be fine. And, and actually, sometimes that can be quite invalidating when we really feel we just need to kind of sit with that emotion. Um, and I think it's really important to realize as well that it's very difficult to hold emotions. And if you haven't um, got your own emotions kind of held and in place, it's very difficult to hold other people's emotions. And sometimes that can come from a place of not being able, it's so uncomfortable. Some emotions are very uncomfortable, whether it's sadness, grief, loss, and people can find it really difficult to sit with that. So they find it much easier to kind of move on and just, you know, go somewhere else because it's too hard for them to sit with that. And I think the importance of with children and with any adults in general just really reminds me of a story when I was um, uh, in a primary school, I was working as a head teacher in a primary school and um, it was so stark one day when a young girl came in to see me and it was some, I don't know, little fight. It wasn't, we're not talking about major bullying. It was like some little fight she'd had with a friend um, was a first time occurrence with this kind of um, child coming in and she started telling me about this fight and I just sat there and I and I listened to what she was saying and I obviously reflected back she was saying um, and after literally about I don't know maybe 30 seconds 60 seconds after I'd finished doing that she looked at me and she's like thank you and and off she went and I just and I thought I literally did nothing like I didn't actually um, give her a solution I didn't actually I literally just heard her out but what she needed was just someone to hear that it was difficult for her and um, to kind of validate those feelings and then she was able to move on and often what happens if we don't um, validate our own emotions or if other people don't validate our emotions we're not able to move on because they're still there and they're not processed and it can be really difficult to do anything else when it's still there and it's not being processed um, and this um, I think what's really um, crucial is understanding that there are obviously are times that we don't want necessarily other people to our emotions and we all wear masks and we all have our own stories about what goes on in our own lives and that is appropriate that is fine but when we start hiding emotions from ourselves and we're not able to realize that we're feeling certain feelings and we're not comfortable sitting with our own feelings that can be really really difficult and the long-term effects can also be huge there's um, a really fabulous book called the body keeps the score and it talks about how specifically looking at trauma but um, looking at how unprocessed emotions the impact that they have on the body um, and I think it's really important to understand that sitting with emotions can be difficult but it but is essential for us really to be able to kind of move on and I think this kind of concept um, is really complex because we have the ability also as human beings to have multiple emotions at the same time. So you can have, for example, um, 
uh, say for example, someone who's celebrating the wedding of a child, but perhaps um, a family member isn't there, having intense joy at the same time as intense pain. Um, and you can have, for example, if you hear a very good friend, if unfortunately you're in a situation where you're not engaged or you don't have a child and someone else does, and it can be a really good friend and you've got intense joy for them, but you also have that pain of, or grief that you haven't got that. So I think that's also really important that there's a whole kind of plethora of emotions we can hold at the same time. And that can be challenging. And again, giving space to each of those emotions. And then also realizing that there's different levels of emotions. So depending on how intense certain people feel, there are really a wonderful book also article about kind of, um, it's called Dandelions and Orchids. It's about different people, how different individuals um, have different sensitivities. And some people feel things really deeply. They just really deeply feel things. And therefore their reactions can be much larger and more, more intense than other people's. Um, and I think moving this towards Torah, if we look at the Torah concept of emotions and we look at um, in terms of how the Torah approaches emotions, we see that it, it's totally in line with this in terms of validating emotions. Um, when we have someone who has lost a relative um, and they're incredibly immediately, they're incredibly distressed and confused and frightened, um, the halacha says that they are not obligated to keep any of the mitzvahs at all because their state of pain and anguish is so much that they need to focus on that and there's no room for anything else. And I think, again, that's the Torah recognizing that we all have sometimes at certain points really intense emotions they, they need our full attention and then that kind of goes on with sitting with the difficult feelings with shiver where people are sitting with that difficult emotion literally not thinking of much else during that time and they're just having that time to process that grief and to be able to really really get to grips with how they're feeling so that their feelings at a later point can kind of move on but it's interesting again within Yiddishkeit how it's staggered depending on what relative it is but how long the mourning period lasts in terms of it might not be a full mourning but there might be other restrictions in terms of weddings and again reflecting again that emotions are there and need to be kind of dealt with. There's actually a very beautiful essay by Rav Yosef Ber Soloveitchik um, that specifically talks about Shiva and talks about these feelings um, and emotions and it's really um, a beautiful article for anyone who would like to kind of read it. Um, and this is, I, I really, I have to say, I really like this clip in the film Inside Out. Um, it's a Disney film and I think it's it's just obviously a, a wonderful film in terms of the deeper levels of emotions and feelings and looking at um, and looking at those and, and how they kind of interact. And one of the very um, one of the kind of main theme is that joy, the feeling of joy is the whole time trying to stop. Um, sadness, this is sadness here, kind of getting in the way of anything because she just wants everything to be happy and, and joyful and, and I don't want any sadness and life should be happy. Um, and she kind of keeps on blocking joy from kind of getting involved. And, and, and this scene, this is a really powerful scene where this is like a pink elephant here. And this is like the, um, it's like her toy, her toy pink elephant that she abandons as she gets older and he's really quite sad about it. Um, and joy, keeps on trying to distract the um, elephant from feeling this feeling and it's just not working he's just not able to kind of move on and until sadness sits down with um with this elephant I'm sorry I've literally forgotten his name now um he she sits down with this elephant and pink elephant and she bing bong. Bing, thank you thank you whoever that was that's really helpful and she sits down with Billy Bong and she she validates the pain that he's going through and she you know she really empathizes with him and again what's amazing is after she sits with him for a few minutes suddenly Billy Bong is able to get up and move on because he's had his sadness validated and Joy almost looks at him in like like, how did you do that? Like, what happened? Because in her eyes, like, we have to all pretend everything's okay the whole time. Whereas she starts to realize actually that sadness is an okay feeling to have. And sometimes in life, you need to sit with that sadness to be able to move on. And it's not easy to sit with that sadness. It really isn't. And depending on what that sadness is and how intense the sadness is, can be really difficult. But it's not helpful to kind of 
just kind of move on. And, and this is really interesting as well, because there's the concept in the Yiddish kind of gum zulatova. And I think sometimes it's misconstrued of like, yeah, everything's okay, like forget any emotions. No, it means gum zoo, also this, this sadness is also, there's a purpose to this, but it doesn't mean don't have sadness and just block it all out and everything's okay. It's okay to sit with sadness and more than okay, you can't process and move on until you really sit with that sadness. Um, and if you look at the Torah, it's replete with emotions all over. I started like quickly typing out as many as I could think of quickly, but the, I, I, after I finished the PowerPoint and I had other things to get on with, I kept on thinking, oh, that one and that one and this one. And, and there's so many, they're all over the place. So, but these are the, just the first literally few that came to mind. But we have, you know, fear, Ozzam and Chava, when they sin and Hashem calls their name. We have, you know, desire Chava as well. We have the jealousy of Kain and Hevel. And then we have it positively with Pinchas. And we have it negatively with Korach. And we have the love of Yaakov and Rochel. And we have that loneliness and that pain that Leah feels when she feels that she's the hated wife. And we have Rochel turning around and saying, if I, you know, I'm Mesa or Nochi, like I can't, I can't manage at all without not having children. And there are so many examples. And the Torah is says these examples because these are humans and there's a recognition that humans have emotions and it's important to deal with those emotions and not to kind of block those emotions and I think the book that really portrays to us the ups and downs in life the feelings of loneliness isolation of kind of friendship of all of these incredible emotions that go through is just reading through Sefer Tehillim when you just read each Tehillim and talks about David's life and he had the difficulties in his life that he went through and he talks about those emotions and then the feelings of happiness that he also has as well it's kind of replete with emotions um and then there's a very famous I think you know I think many people whether it's from an English perspective or a Jewish perspective, but this is a very famous kind of quote. Um, and this kind of looks at the different stages in life from Kehelis. And it says, you know, there is a season set for everything, a time for every experience. And it means again, that each experience has a need and needs to be validated. There is a time to sit and cry and weep. There is a time for happiness and enjoyment. There's a time for mourning. There's a time for dancing. These are, again, feelings that need validation and not just skipping over. They are real feelings and that we need to process. So I suppose we now come to the big question, which is we just have, you know, we have, it says in Tanis, um, it says, Mishanichnas Adar, Mar bin Basimchar, like everyone be happy. And you might hear this and think to yourself, yeah, but what if I don't feel happy? What if it's, it's a difficult time for me and it's not something that I'm feeling at the moment. What does that mean? Does that mean that we should invalidate everything we've just said and, and not have our emotions? Does it mean that we should kind of fake it? Like what, what, what should we do if we're actually holding these emotions? So I think again, we spoke about having two emotions at the same time. It can have a plethora of different emotions, but definitely we can contain two emotions at the same time. But I think the question really becomes as well, what does that mean? What does it mean to be happy? What is happiness? What, like, what, like, what is that, you know? Does it mean I should be dancing? I should be smiling? What should I be doing with my life to make it happy? And obviously this is a key kind of question and I do feel like I'm exploring it here, but there's incredibly more depth to this question that I'm missing out. And I kind of took out a few things here and there and I'm just kind of touching on things, but obviously, in itself, it requires a lot more depth. Okay, so what is happiness? Oh, I'm just pressing mm. and it's not working. Just one second, I'll try again. No? Is it changing for you? No, not changing for me either. It seems to, oh, here we go. There we All go, right. well done. Okay, so what is happiness? So I think Rabbi Tatz has this beautiful whole share on it. So I'm not giving you the whole share, but like I'm just giving you a snapshot of what he says, um, which he says that you can have somebody who is literally in the middle of the desert, sweating away in pain with the biggest smile on their face because they are building their own house, because they are doing something they want to do. So 
You can be in pain and you can be sweating away and be the happiest person on earth. Um, and he talks about the fact that happiness is a byproduct almost of work that you're putting in um, and doing things that are, are valuable and important to you. And um, I think that is the kind of the key concept he talks about. Uh, forgive me if I've got it slightly wrong, but that's what I understood as the kind of key concept that he's trying to kind of get across. And I think that that permeates, you know, into everything when we're kind of living a valued life. And I want to kind of bring in some other people who say similar things, some from a psychology kind of perspective. There is a, a very good book called The Happiness Trap. Um, and that's um, by Russ Harris. And he actually um, very involved in terms of ACT, um, acceptance and, and commitment therapy and um, his kind of approach in that book is again is that if you classify happiness as a feeling if it's like sadness if it's just a feeling well we just said feelings come and feelings go and and nothing is permanent it just comes and goes it's like a fleeting feeling whereas he classifies exactly in line with Robert Tatz's words as well is that happiness is about living a rich full and meaningful life it's um, taking actions and doing things. Oh, I've gone, sorry, back a bit. Um, doing things and taking actions and moving in a direction where we think things are valuable and kind of worthy. Um, it's not a feeling, feeling, it's a profound sense of life worth lived. And Rav Shimshon Rafal Hirsch, he points out the word that the word simcha, um, there are within Hebrew wording, um, certain words he specifically he very much looks into this um, that if there's changeable letters they're kind of related so he looks at the word smicha growth and he said that simcha and smicha are related and that happiness only comes as a result of a person growing towards his spiritual potential and that's only when happiness comes and all of that is kind of echoing the value that happiness is living according to your values it's living according to you want a byproduct of living according to your values doing the things that you feel are meaningful in life oh i've gone back back one um, and I think it's really important to keep this in mind when we're looking at mission what are we saying we're saying that really pushing ourselves to live a life of value to do things that are in line with our values whether it's um, currently you know trying to take an active part in helping refugees trying to take an active part in preparing how one's going to give who was who's who are you going to give to who are the people that might need are you going to be able to give sadaka to poor people it's looking at how am i going to live this month in line with those values and almost purim itself helps us bringing the unity that Joanne spoke about at the beginning by giving the Mishloch Manas and by creating and fostering that feeling. Um, and then also obviously looking in a second, we'll look in a second about that spiritual significance in terms of our relationship with Hashem as well. Transposes. Sorry? Ooh. Should we keep on going? Okay. So... Um, moving on, and I feel like you'll see this relationship between the moods and Esther, between emotions and Esther as we come towards the end, but I really wanted to kind of explore at this point um, Queen Esther's background, her life, her future, the emotions that she must have felt, how she managed the emotions she felt, how did she cope with the challenges, and what really can we learn from her. And I think it's really, really um, when you look at, I actually got quite emotional reading up about um, Queen Esther. There's a lot I knew about her already, but lots of things that came up that I hadn't learned about her previously. So she was an orphan. She didn't have a father or a mother. And we are actually told that she didn't have the opportunity to get to know either of them, that she actually lost her father after her mother became pregnant and she lost her mother at childbirth. So she didn't have an opportunity to know either of her parents so you can imagine the kind of loss and pain that she grew up with dealing with that of not having that security from either parent um later on in later on in the Purim story we kind of she's taken in by the challenges that she's had that, you know you're taking a pure innocent kind of girl and she's kind of in this palace where everyone's kind of like making themselves up and doing things and, and what's so interesting is as Vatissa um, and she's found favor in everyone's eyes that saw her 
And you think this is what is so interesting. Like everyone there is like so busy with their things and, and she's the one that stands out and she's the one that didn't do the makeup and didn't go to each of those kind of, and because she was genuine, she had her values and she knew what was important. And that stood out, that internal self-worth that she had of what she stood for stood out. Um, and she was married to Hashverosh actually. Um, and it, we learned that from the words he took her as a, as a daughter, Labas as a daughter, Labias as a house. There's a whole a Gemara about that. Um, and um, the challenges she had with that. So she's taken from marrying almost from the kind of God al Hadar, mm -hmm. the kind of greatest man in the generation, and then living a life with a Hashverosh who is so vile that he is happy to ask his wife to come down naked and parade um, and living a life with him. And you can imagine that contrast and the kind of feelings of the security that she might have had living with Mordechai and then suddenly being with Achashverosh and being in that kind of environment. And we actually told her, another name for Esther is Hadassah because she was like a myrtle. And again, that kind of, she was able amongst all this kind of evil to kind of maintain that beautiful smell and to maintain that purity of um, that purity. We also hear that in terms of um, there's lots of other sources that talk about how she was able to keep Shabbos by name by having different maids on different days. There's a very interesting one I'd never seen before about her keeping kosher actually, which was interesting as well. That Achashverosh actually let her keep kosher, and, and that I haven't explored that, but that was an interesting thing I read as well. And despite all of this, she was able to almost kind of remain true to her values. But you can imagine again the emotions that she must have been going through at that point. How, how was she able to be, have such a difficult upbringing and end up in this kind of difficult situation? How was she able to almost manage that? Okay, so um, we spoke about her relationship with Mordechai, but what was really interesting is actually, even when she was um, almost kind of with Achashver, she still had Mordechai's support because she, had, did not choose to go to the palace. She was forced to go to the palace. She um, had no choice in the matter. It was not willing. She was kind of coerced to do what she didn't want to do. Um, and we know that um, before she went to Achashverosh, a Mordechai said to her, you know, this is, who knows if the time that you've been put here is for this reason to kind of go and stand up for the Jews. And before she goes to Achashverosh, she, you can imagine kind of the fear that she had and actually we are told again that she was so so fearful um the anxiety showed itself in her body and her body actually she suffered physically because she was so fearful of going because she knew she was kind of risking her physical life but more than her physical life we hear as well that she says i'm not sure which way it goes avadati um, that I will kind of perish, like uh, I'm giving up everything. And what does she mean by that? And we actually, I don't know if I, I think I might have actually put this down. Here we go. I did. Um, and Rav Abba says, like, what was going on here? Why did she say Avadati means destroyed? Like, I'm going to kind of be destroyed if I go to the king. And Rabbi Abba says, because she was, she was, it was not her own free will to be. With Achashverosh, she had no choice in the matter. But when she was going to now, of her own accord, approach him, she was she felt she was then going to be lost because um, because she was coerced and she had no choice in the matter. Um, she was still permitted to her husband. However, Mordechai. However, as soon as she would willingly go in front of the king, she would no longer be permissible to her own husband. So she was not only giving up her physical life, but she was giving up all hope of being together with Mordechai again. She was giving up all hope of the closeness that she had with him and basically saying, I am going to be just Achashverosh's wife. I am going to be Queen Esther, whose whole life is Achashverosh and is the palace and is all of this. So you can imagine the kind of what she was giving up here when she was going in front of the mm. front, in front of Achashverosh. And in her eyes, the kind of worth and value she was giving to the future of Amisran and how crucial she knew that this was to their survival. And um, afterwards, after, you know, she was granted, you know, her wish and he did, um, 
he did, um, I can't think of the word there, so he did give the scepter to her so she was able to not die. She still had given up all future hope of her life with Mordechai. And even actually, um, she only, uh, uh, the general consensus is her son was Daryovish. She had one son, and this was actually before this, she had the son Daryovish. Um, and he in, he, he in the future would actually help B'nai Israel build um, he would allow them to build the base of Midrash and he actually gave funds to help, but he was, for all intents and purposes, um, not living a Jewish life in any way or form. So she didn't even have, let's say, nachas from her children, she didn't even have that. She had her son who was living basically a non-Jewish life. How, I mean, just like how, when you think like how she was able to keep on going and how she was able to almost deal with all of that. Um, and I think, a few things that we can kind of learn from there is that what was she holding on to and how was she coping? And her real kind of coping was that she had such a deep understanding of the purpose and meaning of her life. She was able to understand that it was for Klali Israel. She was able to understand that Hashem was with her. Um, we say, it says when she went before the king that she, Vatilba, she wore a big day, she wore royal clothes. And again, we, what does she mean she wore royal clothes? We're told she clothed herself with the Shekhinah, she clothed herself, she had Hashem with her. And actually, there's a, a Tehillim written that actually is a Tehillim that we're told is kind of happening at the time she went before the king. And there's a posik in there that is really powerful. She says, Kaili, Kaili, Loma Azaz, Loma Azaz Tani. And she walked into the chamber of the king and the Shekhinah temporarily left her because of the idol worship within there. But actually, then it came back and just the feelings of helplessness when that left her, because that was her, that was her lifeline. That was her crux. She was living her life fully with an understanding that Hashem was with her and the purpose of of her, of her being was to have that relationship with Hashem and to focus on what was mm. actually meaningful. And um, um, that really is what kept her going. But again, I'm sure she did not deny the fact that she had an incredible difficult life, um, incredible challenges, and she had to sit with those challenges and with those emotions. But by seeing a bigger picture, by almost having the ability to understand that her life was not just about her, but had far more, uh, far more meaning to it, kind of a bigger picture. And that is kind of her name itself, her name Esther, hidden, almost her ability to understand that there is something much bigger that I'm not understanding here, that there is a bigger picture that maybe at this point I don't have comprehension for. And it's really interesting to note that Esther was the one who actually asked for the Megillah to be written she had the foresight to understand from her life that this was a bigger picture here and it mustn't be lost forever. It was her that prompted the writing of the Megillah that it should be written down. And I think that understanding the bigger picture that behind every mask, there is somebody. And when the mask is there, we might not understand who it is or what it is or what that purpose is, but that Hashem is behind that mask that we might not see it. We might have very difficult, challenging lives that are really hard to understand, but there is a purpose, there is kind of a meaning. Um, and what, what knowing Esther's life, what was really difficult for me is kind of feeling her pain almost. I felt like I was, I was like, as I think about Esther, I kind of feel the pain that she's going through and, and how difficult her life has. And I, I had I heard a share by Rabbi Y.Y. Jacobson that I felt really reframed that pain. And he reframed that pain by think, by saying, yes, her life was extremely difficult, but look, every single Jewish child that is born afterwards is her credit, is her zechus, is her merit, is her nachas. Every single Jewish child, the fact that the, that the Jewish people continue is because of her and because of almost what she gave up for that bigger picture. And obviously this is incredible and huge on her level and incredible for us to see like, wow. But then again, you know, I look at certain people and I see, you know, for example, that wonderful video that many of us saw of Rafal Kruskal kind of leading Kiddush in, in, you know, coming off a bus traveling on Shabbos in Ukraine to kind of rescue the kind of children in the orphanage of Odessa and the Jewish people there. And I, I saw a wonderful um, quote that someone wrote on one of the, on the fundraising page, but it said, you know, wow, Rafal, you, you're not, a shepherd never leaves his sheep. You know, and then it was like, we want Mashiach now. Like, look at this, that somebody is prepared to give up their entire being for their flock. And 
I know, you know, other people in terms of Jem Posen also there, you know, willing to kind of give up uh, and, and kind of give himself so that fully that he is with those people. And I think these are people that we can kind of see or almost, and I'm sure like, you know, they're not, they're, they're kind of the, the, the happiness is not necessarily dancing for joy, but the value, seeing that there's a value to what they're doing and there's real meaning to what they're doing um, behind you know, them. And I think this is the koach of Esther, that she was able to do this, that she was able to look at the bigger picture, to look at meaning, to look beyond. And that is her simcha, that was her happiness, that was her ability once she did that, to feel content, to have that inner calm. As we went back in the beginning, happiness is living a life worth of meaning. It's not necessarily living a life of just jumping up for joy the whole time. It's understanding that there's a purpose. Mm. And there's a beautiful, in the Haskama to the Lekach Tov, Rabdov Yaffa writes a beautiful, I thought this phrase is really beautiful, where he says that without emuna, in order to have simcha, you need to forget the truth. You need to kind of live life and, and pretend and kind of submerge your feelings and kind of go out and party without thinking things through and without kind of escaping reality, forgetting the truth because it's too difficult. Whereas with Emuna, in order to have Simcha, you need to remember the truth. You need to understand that there is a bigger picture, that we don't understand it fully, that we try our best to kind of lead, lead, lead our lives with meaning. Um, and again, crucial, um, crucial quote by Viktor Frankl in Man's Search for Meaning, you know, we can deal with anything in our lives as long as it contains meaning. He who has a why to live can bear almost any how. And I think, you know, in his whole book of Man's Search for Meaning, when he explains almost going through the Holocaust and, and looking at those who were able to find meaning, and if you, if you had meaning, and meaning could take many forms, it might be a spiritual meaning, it might be meaning of love. If you could find meaning in your life, then you, have, you can bear life, you can, you can see a future, you can keep on going. And um, I was really thinking about my emotions, you know, these lovely pictures that you often see people make, I was really thinking about my emotions about it's difficult for us to kind of say, oh, Esther was feeling this. We don't know exactly what she's feeling. We can work out from what we read how she must have been feeling. But I just was thinking about what are my feelings? How do I feel about mm. Esther? And I I'm, I think my there's quite a few words, but the awe that she was so prepared to kind of give up everything for the Jewish nation, for the future, that she was able to put her whole self on the line a life worth lived where the whole future of a nation was dependent on her and where she was able every day to kind of appreciate um, the value of her life. You know, the faith that Emunah that she was able, you know, to have, she had no one else. You know, Hashem was the only one really with her. She didn't have parents. She didn't have a spouse. She, I mean, she had a spouse, she had a chashverish, but not much of a spouse who would have necessarily understood in any way, you know, grotesque and, and evil, you know, the, you know, in all ways, um, and she was able almost to channel that faith in her Kaddish Baruch and understand that he was with her. The kind of fear she felt when she must have gone before Achashverosh, the pain that she must have felt on the loss of her life and the loss of, you know, her marriage and her future uh, and her Yiddishkeit and, and how she could have been and the life she might have dreamed she would have lived, perhaps. Um, the kind of, um, I'm trying to think of what else, the other words that I wrote in here, trust, faith, bravery, the loneliness, that it must have been a really lonely place to be for her. Um, and yet she kept on going, you know, with, you know, what she was doing. And I think these are just really crucial to understand for us, you know, how we can kind of have these emotions, but to keep on going and to persevere. And I actually put it in the kind of shape of a smiley face on purpose to say that, all of those feelings together culminated still in her, in her happiness because it was all for a purpose. It was all for something meaningful in her, for her. And I think again, that happiness was a result of almost all those emotions because, and almost a result of that meaning. Um, and I think in summary, you know, 
Esther was an example of somebody living an incredibly difficult life, yet someone who was able to withstand because she had Hashem in her life and she lived by her values. Um, and, you know, interestingly, when there's um, work as a cognitive behavior therapist that we do with depression, and one of the things we do with depression in terms of behavior activation is looking at what are your values in life? What, what do you want to live by? Are you living your life currently by your values? And that can be a really powerful exercise for people because we don't always take stock of what our values are and if we're living our life by them. And I think it, it reminds us almost to kind of have that in mind. And I think as well, what's really important is seeing, you know, um, coming towards Purim and Pesach, they're both months of Geula, of redemption. And it almost are kind of own redemptions by looking at where are we going in life? What is meaningful in our life? What is important? What are our values? And are we living by those? And I listened to a share and I, I was debating about including this at one point by Rabbi Pel Pelkovitz, uh, Rabbi Dr. Pelkovitz. And he, he gave a share as a share on, um, I'm not sure it's not on, um, it's not on TED Talks. It's like a Jewish equivalent of TED Talks. Um, and in it, it's on happiness. And in it, he speaks about this family he was speaking at a um, camp, it was a Camp Simcha kind of retreat in America. And they were having like a smaller discussion kind of in a cell car and they were all talking about things. And someone shared with the group that he just wants to kind of share, he doesn't know where it's coming from, but he was um, a chassid on Friday night in shul and he just wanted to say, I, I had this wave of tremendous simcha that just came over me. And I just felt this powerful feeling of happiness. And he, and he said, I didn't understand it. Like we're going through such a difficult time. Like, why am I feeling this like almost like wave of happiness? And um, I, might have, I hope I've kind of, again, explained this as clearly as Rabbi, as Dr. Pelkovitz does. I think maybe you should listen, it might be clearer, but the kind of summary I got from it was that this kind of father was feeling, I, I know what's valuable to me now. I know what's so important to me and I'm fully focused on that value now. And I'm fully focused on what are my priorities in life. I'm not sidetracked by, by other things, by arguments. I'm not sidetracked by money. I'm not sidetracked by broigases. I'm not sidetracked by all of these enjoyment. All I'm focusing on are my values of life. And that in itself is giving me such simcha. And that can be, you know, when I heard that, I was like, wow, that is so, like, was difficult to hear almost, but actually, the power of that, the real power of being able to feel simple because you've got so much meaning in your life. And I think that the emotion of happiness is the culmination of living a valued purpose for life. And I think that's something that coming into Mishanechas Adar Mar Bim Simcha, like we should be focusing on and reminding ourselves of, and especially at times like this, um, when things are difficult, kind of reminding ourselves of what our priorities are. Um, and I think really that 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 is all I really kind of wanted to share with everyone um, and really wishing everyone a kind of meaningful and simchadik Purim. And just um, obviously, if there are any questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer them if there are.